Um, next up, I'm very excited to introduce Zainab Ja, she, her, who is a senior research analyst on the research and strategy team at the Collaborative, formerly known as National Birth Equity Collaborative. She re received her master's in public health from Rollins School of Public Health at Emory with a background in behavioral science and health education with mental health certificate. At the Collaborative, she's worked on coalitions and projects fo focusing on foreign policy, family planning, and sexual and reproductive health rights and justice for Black women and birthing people transnationally. She's currently supporting the research team on the Respectful Maternity Care Initiative, the development of birth equity research measures, and other projects to explore Black maternal health. She also supports projects that center birth equity and climate change solutions for Black birthing people. Very pleased to introduce, please join me in welcoming Zainab Ja. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning and good afternoon if you're joining virtually. So happy to be here today. And thank you so much for Nurturely for introducing me to the space. And I'm getting to present alongside folks that I reference in my presentation. So that's really exciting for me. All right. So first, wanting to just introduce a little bit about myself and who I am and my identities and how I show up in this work. So it's a lovely picture of me and my parents. Uh, my father is from Freetown, Sierra Leone. So I'm a daughter, I'm a daughter of an immigrant and my mother's from Arroyo, Puerto Rico. So that deeply informs my work and how I show up into this work. And as you all may know, those both of those places are directly impacted by hurricanes and extreme heat. So I have family members that both definitely reside in those areas and are directly impacted by climate change. I was raised in Duncan, South Carolina. Um, so having my identities and being raised in this area and being Muslim was really interesting. Um, I feel like I was often the different one, but also I got my community and um, I was accepted as well, but the race, the South definitely raised me as well. Um, I went to Emory for undergrad and for grad school, so I'm a double eagle. Um, and this is where I really got my introduction into really doing community-based research. And I was lucky enough to be brought on at Sister Love as a researcher. So Sister Love was my introduction to reproductive justice. Um, and completely changed my life and my career trajectory, and that's where I am, where I am today. And now I'm at NBEC. So NBEC, or the collaborative, which we're going by now, um, we really center transnational solutions to optimize Black maternal health outcomes, infant outcomes, sexual reproductive well-being. And we do this through a lot of things, training, research, technical assistance, capacity building as well. With values of radical joy, a lot of times in this work, we really, it's very crucial to uplift and center joy in the work that we're doing because it is really, really heavy. Um, and we have a vision that all black mamas, babies, and their villages will thrive. So for the agenda, I'll talk a little bit about the connection between reproductive justice and the climate crisis. Um, I will then go into detailing climate change impacts and compounding in existing inequities and injustices among maternal health outcomes. And then I will discuss how climate change impacts the work of doulas. So this slide, just to do RJ grounding, um, this is Miss Lita Ross, if you don't have this book, highly recommend. Um, but Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the human right to bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and to parent children in safe and sustainable communities, and really wanting to uplift the key about healthy and safe environments for children to be uh, to grow up. And so reproductive justice as a concept really acknowledges the conditions that dictate someone's reproductive outcomes. And it utilizes an intersectional approach in recognizing housing, food insecurity, air quality as RJ issues, and directly impacting um, reproductive outcomes. And we see how climate can impact all of those components. And so um, in seeing this, there's a lot of systemic manipulation of black communities and thinking about one specifically, the location of uh, toxic waste facilities and how that directly impacts and emits pollutants into um, air quality, into water as well. And that directly has an impact on reproductive health outcomes. Um, and we have also seen how racist policies such as redlining results in um, housing insecurity, 
food deserts, um, emergency responses, and healthcare as well. And we have seen how black environmental justice leaders have really called out some of these um, negative impacts, such as the unjust exposure to lead in black families as well. So this really utilizes and shows how the climate crisis needs a reproductive justice um, background and the framing to really move forward in the advocacy than the work that we're doing. So overview, overview of climate change. We saw this slide earlier, <laughs> lots of alignment <laughs> and what's happening. So I won't spend that long on here, but really wanting to uplift that um, in the last few years, climate change has really been recognized as a public health issue. And that's very crucial because in human health impact is really where we see justice and equities as well. And so what we have here is a lot, but it's a great visual of all the ways in which climate change directly impacts human health. And so I wanted to talk through a little bit of the global implications of climate change. And so um, globally, women of color and black mothers uh, have fewer resources to really navigate through climate crisis, such as wildfires, hurricanes, et cetera. We have here Sky Wheeler's <laughs> commentary on the pregnancy in the path of hurricanes remembering Puerto Rico. And this really stood out to me and was really personal as well, because I had a Thea that was pregnant during Hurricane Maria as well. and just being so anxious and wanting to reach out and hear more about how she was doing and how she was navigating it. So it's really dear to my heart. So what we see happens um, globally is forced displacement and this results in negative maternal um, and child health outcomes, really looking at morbidity and mortality. So a lot of the common challenges that are seen are um, food insecurity, lack of access to clean potable water, sanitation and birth attendance as well. So a disruption to care. And regarding lack of clean water, um, that's a direct result into poor health outcomes. So pregnant people need increased water intake throughout their pregnancy. And if they have infants that are formula fed, they need clean water. If they were breastfeeding, they need water and proper nutrients. So there's just so many impacting ways that um, displacement and lack of clean water and resources are directly impacting pregnancy and um, maternal health outcomes. And a lot of these things are not um, included within emergency preparedness as well, which is very, very crucial. All right. All right. So why climate justice and why we need to utilize an approach, a, a justice approach? So um, there are many racist policies in the U.S. that create more disproportionate risk for black communities. And I'm really centering on black communities because at the collaborative, we are really trying to address the black maternal health uh, crisis. So in 2021, which feels like a lifetime ago, but then just yesterday, um, the EPA created a fact sheet to really highlight and uplift the cli climate change impacts on black communities. And they found that black and African American individuals are more likely to live in areas with the highest increase in childhood asthma diagnosis, um, increases in mortality rates due to climate driven changes, and um, higher rates of labor hours losses to weather exposed workers as well. And so this is why a justice approach is really important to really address this urgent crisis we have at hand. And so what I have listed here are the different pillars of climate justice and how it addresses all of these different petals in this flower. Um, so it's very important and crucial to uplift and center community um, within any of the um, advocacy work that we're doing, the policies, the resources that we're creating and to integrate communities and in developing those resources as well, or research or whatever's being done, indigenous knowledge, knowledge and solutions as well. It's crucial that um, to bridge movements. A lot of this work is so siloed, and we see that a lot with perinatal uh, health and climate change, and we really need to dismantle silos and really synergize. So that's why climate justice is so great, because it brings in together social, racial, and e environmental justice. Um, it utilizes a human rights approach, which I talked a little bit about in the reproductive justice framework as well. Um, and equitable and accessible resources is so, so, so crucial. We've seen that as an intervention that is being told through the research that we're seeing, like we need interventions and that needs to be accessible to vast communities. And down here, which is cut off, um, accountability. Uh, a lot of the different folks have talked about how the U.S. is the great, greatest emitter, but we're not really impacted as much and really needing to hold these systems accountable to ensure that we are really addressing this urgent issue. 
So climate change and maternal health, a lot of what I'm gonna say has been said already, but we'll go into it a little bit. So looking at the climate impacts on uh, maternal health, I have a few boxes here that really uplift the ways in which climate change is negatively impacting maternal health. One being sea level rise. So with sea level rise, we have seen that salty drinking water has resulted in um, blood pressure, high blood pressure for pregnancy. Um, and there's some studies that have shown that this is happening in Bangladesh. Um, extreme weather, there's stress and displacement that occurs, and that is linked to worse birth outcomes. And really thinking about, as I mentioned before, disruption of care and um, loss of key services such as lactation support. We have poor housing or um, housing insecurity and thinking about things such as uh, flooding and now your house is damaged and where can you go and all of the resources you had now are suddenly not there and lost. So thinking about how that disruption as well can impact birth outcomes. Vector-borne diseases such as um, malaria and Lyme disease, of course, has uh, negative outcomes for health implications. And chronic stress as well, just thinking about um, the mental health implications of the climate crisis and how that may be impacting pregnant people. There isn't a lot of research in this space, and so we're, I'm really excited to see what comes into this space of research and to hear more about how um, climate change is really impacting that. So I'll do a deeper dive into heat um, and why heat is a maternal health problem. So many studies from all over the world have shown a connection of extreme heat exposure and negative birth outcomes, which was covered in the past two hours. Um, and I will also highlight um, the study that Dr. Basu was um, included on as an author and thinking about um, the significant impact of exposure to extreme heat um, resulted in preterm birth, low birth weight, and stillbirth as, as well. And when studies are disaggregated by race, the subpopulations at higher risk for persons with asthma and minority groups who are especially black mothers, and this is another study as well. So we see that United States already has a maternal health crisis that's really, really um, defined by racial inequities that occur. And we see that the, um, our concern is climate change is only going to exacerbate those rates as they are already, and it's very, very scary to look at but also why it's important to have these conversations and why it's really important to bring folks together to discuss this issue. So to highlight a few more studies um, around why heat is a maternal health problem, um, and just wanting to take a step back and think about when your body overheats, um, you may have heat exhaustion, a heat stroke, dehydration, and if you're pregnant, obviously it's gonna be more difficult to regulate your body temperature and wanting to uplift pregnant worker, workers as well. There are pregnant workers that are exposed to heat and just thinking about how difficult it is for them to navigate that. Shout out to Better Balance who does the work to really advocate for pregnant workers and really navigating those situations. So a few studies um, highlighted gestational diabetes and heat as an issue. There is a connection between hot summer weather and increased risk of gestational diabetes. There are more studies that have highlighted a higher risk of developing high blood pressure or preeclampsia when exposed to heat. And there are other studies that highlight pregnancy complications such as exposed heat, exposed um, extreme heat and longer maternal hospitalizations, um, and then immediate and prolonged effect of extreme heat exposure as well. And we have seen that these rates are higher among black, um, black mothers. Another special note is um, there are studies that have been done that show that there is a connection between interpersonal violence and heat waves and just wanting to recognize that intersection as well and really acknowledging um, that is one of the leading deaths of pregnant people thinking about violence. So what can be done to protect and support mamas during the climate crisis? This is just four examples, um, but one is really addressing systemic racism and racist policies that exist within the United States. That impacts all of the resources we possibly have our day-to-day -day lives, such as housing, food, and economic stability. And this also impacts um, emergency preparedness and emergency responses as well. We need to ensure that there's um, access to services available such as telehealth. So if there is a climate crisis where you're not able to go see your provider or see someone that is on your birth team, 
um, having access to telehealth or some sort of um, avenue to getting that help or care wherever you are. We need to develop more protections for pregnant people such as heat vulnerability index or emergency preparedness plans. And aligned with one of the pillars of climate justice, providing resources to those that are greatly impacted by the climate crisis. And we will, the box is a little off, but <laughs> we will highlight this and this is where um, doulas really come into play. So doulas and the climate crisis. Um, highlighted here are two organizations that are doing phenomenal work in the um, climate change space as doula collectives is Birthmark Doula. They're located in New Orleans and Metro Mommy Agency located in Miami, Florida. And some of the um, many, many, many um, ways that doulas are fantastic in addressing maternal health outcomes, this is just a handful. Um, doulas are trusted in communities. They have lived experiences. They can connect with those that live within, within the communities of their clients. They spend a great amount of time of clients throughout their pregnancy and thinking about um, and hearing stories from the research I'm already doing with my team, um, how a lot of pregnant people feel very frustrated with the amount of time they get with their provider, but doula spend so much time throughout the entire pregnancy. And special highlight to Health Connect One, they're doing great work and really capturing what doulas are doing outside of just direct care and the amount of time they spend and dedicate to their clients throughout their pregnancy. They create plans to support mamas throughout their pregnancy. They can take time to adjust the plans based off of their needs and any changes that may be occurring in their environment. They act as environment uh, information holders and advocates for their clients and community members as well. And they may already be interested in advocating for different things within their communities. Gonna have another shout out for um, Esther McCann, who is at Metro Mommy Agency, who we collaborated with with Sky to develop a training for a group of doulas to really drive these connections of climate change, impacts on maternal health and reproductive justice. And so the next few slides are from that training. Um, Tony Oberly, who was also at the collaborative, developed these slides. Uh, she is a doula, so she was really able to integrate and show how doulas can directly integrate climate change solutions within her work. So a few interventions to support clients that doulas may take. We have heat. Um, so of course, we want to recognize and uplift that doulas do a lot of work. And the goal is not to add on to what they're doing, but to just seamlessly integrate within the work they're already doing. So with heat, if a doula is creating a food diary for their client, they can have a tracking water intake component on there to ensure that they are getting the water that they need, especially if they are exposed to extreme heat. Suggestions to stay inside if possible and seek shade. Um, and there's also recommendations to look at the weather app to look at the feels like temperature as well. Um, and recognizing humidity can increase how hot it is, how hot it feels outside. For air quality, um, there are suggestions as well on the weather app. There is a little part that monitors the air that can really indicate whether someone may or may not want to go outside. Of course, sometimes it's hard to avoid that, but it is something to just look out for. And emergency planning as well. So working with providers or folks on the birth team to really integrate like a plan just in case something happens um, within their, their ending birth plan. And here we have a deeper dive. Um, New Orleans Birthing Breastfeeding Center created this resource named Tips for a Safe Infant Feeding in Disasters, which is very helpful. So this is a long list, but a few of them is making an emergency contact list, um, create a prenatal supply list, packing a bag early with specific things that you need, um, talk about cup feeding as an alternative to bottle feeding. There's so many resources and people are doing this work already and really trying to figure out how to navigate um, breastfeeding in disasters. But, you know, we need to ensure that this is more widely available for folks. And this is a mock workflow. Again, shout out to Tony, but she showed the different stages of someone's pregnancy and the different ways in which that you can integrate and think about climate change mitigation each step of the way. So air conditioning, neighborhood heat, flood risk, heat exposure, opportunity for break. All of these are aligned with the ways in which climate change may directly impact their day to day. And it's so important because doulas can check in and really get an understanding of the working and living um, environments of the person. So 
Uh, really excited to talk about the doula survey that um, is being created in collaboration with Human Rights Watch, March of Dimes, the Collaborative, and the National Association of Nurse Practitioners in, human, in hum Women's Health. And our goal is just simply one, to understand what doulas are already doing and helping their clients navigate the climate crisis. Um, we want to know what they're doing to protect them. We want to know like the type of solutions they're providing. We want to understand if they are concerned and even interested in environmental health and want to integrate it within their work. We want to learn if they would be open to getting funding and additional resources as it relates to environmental injustices and climate change. And really, we want to build a community. Like we see that doulas are existing and working together on this front, but if we can even nationwide build solidarity and an area to collaborate and share best practices, we want to do that. So we are early, early stage. We are now building our recruitment plan, but we're really going to use snowballing sampling. So that's just connecting within networks. Um, so we're building out that list now and reaching out to our networks. And we really hope to publish these results among participants, one, but also both with climate and maternal health organizations. We feel like it's very crucial to share this amongst all parties um, in hopes that we can really collaborate and come together and really figure out what to do with the findings. We want to engage in advocacy for more resources with EPA and this long list of folks, but you know that's where a lot of power is held in policy and really figuring out ways to get more money and more resources to doulas because that's so crucial in the work that they're doing. We are also working on a doula curriculum and training. So as I mentioned, we did like this first pilot study um, and we're hoping we got great feedback and we're hoping to do it more nationally. So. We believe with the information that we get from this survey, it will be able to help inform what we include in a curriculum, how to expand the trainings, incorporate more of what they're already doing. We want to learn from them. So that's really the goal um, and connect them as well. So we're really excited about how this survey can impact and build out this as a project as well. If you know of any doulas, please email me. My email's cut off, but it's zja at birthequity.org. If you know of any doulas that would like to take this study, please share it with me. And how to be engaged in this work. So a few actions moving forward is one, to dismantle the silos between maternal health and climate and environmental justice. We keep saying this and we're gonna keep trying to, to work through that. Um, it's really crucially important to uplift the work doulas are currently doing to support their clients. They really are acting as frontline workers to the climate crisis. And we just wanna to continue to uplift them, show appreciation and love, but also advocate on behalf of doulas as well to ensure they're getting the funding and resources that they need and deserve. And advocate for doula compensation. I'll keep saying that, I'll scream it until my legs cannot handle it anymore. <laughs> Um, and we also have a list of national advocacy opportunities as well. So I met Emily through the March of Dimes EJ group. So that is a group where we are really doing work to really um, bring in together maternal health and what's happening in environmental justice space and resources we can create, ways that we can advocate, et cetera. So if you're interested, reach out. Of course, we have the Protecting Moms and Babies Against Climate Change Bill that is part of Momnibus. That is incredibly crucial because one, it provides more resources and funding for community health workers and doulas and birth attendants. It provides an opportunity to create trainings for healthcare providers to really identify um, what risks may be happening with their, their patients as it relates to climate change. So that is something that we are continuously advocating for at the collaborative and we hope to see more and more. Um, we hope to see it be enacted. Um, Health and Human Services, Natural Resources Defense Council, and White House EJ Advisory Council all have work groups that are really working at this intersection, and we are trying our best to push to really integrate pregnancy, pregnant people, um, maternal health outcomes, and having an RJ person that's particularly in these spaces to really uplift that framework, to really get to where we want to uh, get, and that's birth equity. So I just had a few discussion questions. They could just be moments of reflection for folks that are virtual, but thinking about how you see climate change impacting your direct community. Um, if you have any feedback on how to best advocate for resources for doulas, if you are already doing this work. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone have any questions or any share? I want to share any reflections. Thank you so much for that talk. I just um, the whole time I was thinking, you know, a lot of the work that I do as an epidemiologist is this large scale, population based, big picture, um, and to see it, you know, some of those, um, some of that work translated down to the community level and to the doulas specifically, just gives me so much pleasure to see this. I just blown away by your presentation and so happy. Um, that survey, um, what do you plan to do with those results? Is it gonna be something that you can directly implement into uh, practices or um, maybe if you could just, I, I, that, that was just one question that I had. Yeah, yeah, I think we are, because it's a survey and it will be like quantitative and open end, we're trying to figure out what to do based off of what the, the doulas want to do with it. So I think, I don't know if it will necessarily be published as a white paper, but really finding resources, one pagers, webinars, ways to make it collaborative amongst doulas, I think are some of our like priorities. Um, I'm like a community based researcher. So I'm like, my like mind goes to what can we publish and get directly to community members and folks that are directly impacted. Um, but of course, we want to use the findings to find ways to really push for like policy and legislation as well. That's great. Thank you. And Sky, feel free to hop in because collaborating on it. <laughs> no, I, well, I actually wanted to um, just say, like, I really appreciated the well, a lot about your work and what you're doing, but also um, how you touch not only on the international implications and how we have to see this transnationally as your organization um, talks about, but also the many different impacts. So today we've looked a lot of, at heat and air pollution. And so, and these have these amazing kind of biological, um, this epidemiology that shows all these associations. But when you say climate change impacting your community, I, I, um, like low income people who are having their basements repeatedly flooded um, and just the um, impact that has on families, the sense of struggle <laughs> and then the economic impacts as well and how all of that is totally relevant to pregnancy as well as some of these um, like sort of absolutely fascinating and scary like biological impacts and you know like black carbon crossing the placenta but there's also when you ask this question I also think like economics 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 like mm -hmm. who is being hit hardest in the pocket by these kind of even like not massive disasters just like mm -hmm. too much rain and houses that aren't ready for where we're at yeah looking at Fort Lauderdale and the flooding that's occurring there or Texas and winter storms there are a lot of those situations that aren't necessarily brought up as much that I feel like are direct impacts of climate change. I just wanted to thank you as a birth worker and thank the collaborative for doing this work. Um, I think as a doula provider, like sometimes you can feel really isolated doing the work unless you are in community. And since so many birth workers are also just advocates in general to kind of take this on in addition um, can be pretty scary, like on the mental health side of things mm -hmm. as a provider. Um, and so I really appreciate your question and your presentation around like what do doulas need in terms of like solidarity even? I think that's such a big, a big piece of it um, because, you know, as Emily mentioned opening the event today, like the, this, this intersection isn't new and so much of care work goes unseen. Mm -hmm. um, and so just by naming that this is something that's happening among doulas and giving the opportunity for people to connect to these organizations and each other, I think is in and of itself a part of a way to keep the work going. Mm -hmm. Because the alternative is that I'm dealing with the same effects in my own life, perhaps, and trying to support my clients and feeling like I don't know where to turn, which is very mm -hmm. tempting to like not do any of it, right? Like it can be very overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. So I think just the fact that you're gathering responses and getting this sense of like these diverse but unified experiences around this is hugely important to furthering the workforce. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I also want to uplift something you just noted, like these doulas are also being impacted by climate change. So mm -hmm. hoping that these resources can help them navigate and now they're information holders and 
champions in the space and can share those resources widely. Anyone else? It's more that I just wanted to acknowledge um, what a meaningful presentation this was for me. I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional. <laughs> um, but um, in my work, we try so much to break down silos between even climate and environmental justice and racial justice. So you, for you to bring in reproductive justice and the intergenerational impacts that we see carried out through all of those movements is just so special. And um, it makes me feel more connected to the work that you have all done, even though it's been extremely siloed in the way that a lot of conversations have happened and in a lot of ways that our professions are shaped and the partnerships that um, you know society has pushed us towards or not pushed us towards. And um, I think it was extremely helpful for me to hear from your perspective, to hear a lot about the calls to action at the community level, at the policy level, um, throughout programs, and to hear that we're all kind of fighting in these specific areas, but there is this large overarching um, way for us to connect all of these movements and these conversations are so important to pushing that forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you, Z, so much. That was thank amazing. You. Please join me in thanking Z. Thank you.